Okay, so we got two, two great big goals with this series today. The first one is to teach you more about the Bible and the people of the Bible. And the second one is to encourage you to trust God in a greater way. How many would say that you, there's been areas of your life or times in your life that you have not trusted God? Anybody here? Now, come on. I, there's been times in my life that I haven't trusted God. We've all been there. Don't start lying right in the middle of church this morning. Raise your hand. Look to your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Look to the neighbor you ignored and say, he's talking to you too. And then apologize for ignoring them first. Amen. So we're kicking off a new series called Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. And uh, we're excited about it. And uh, we're looking at different characters in the Bible and how God used these men and women to do miraculous things. How many of you know that God has set you up not to just to be ordinary? He's called you to be extraordinary. He's called you to be super. And there's a reason that we all like the Marvel comic books and everything. We all like the supernatural. And the deal is God has not designed you to be natural. You're a supernatural being living in a natural world. And God's called you to do supernatural things, and his power is on you to do those things. And so with these people that we're going to be studying over the next eight weeks, uh, we want you to tap into how their life was ordinary, but through God and with God, it becomes extraordinary. And so these are our goals for this series. Our key passage for the series, if you'll open with me to Hebrews 12.1, uh, it's found there. And we're going to read this verse every single week for the next eight weeks. And this verse says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, huge crowd of witnesses, you know there's people watching you, that there's windows in heaven, and there's a huge crowd of witnesses looking down on you. And we're surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. And it says, so let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Every weight. What does that look like? Well, it says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. You ever been running your race and just feel like you're going nowhere? There's things in our life that trip, that life that trip us up and keep us from going where God wants us to go. And the Word of God is saying, let us strip off every weight. You know, there's some unnecessary weights that we carry around in life. There's some things that we carry that we shouldn't carry. There's some disappointments maybe in your life today. There's some pain that's in your life today. There's some situations that are out of your control. And when we don't give those situations and we don't give those things to God, we unnecessarily carry them. And our body and our heart and our mind was never designed to carry these burdens. That's why Jesus was sent, so that we could have freedom, so that we could have life and have it to the full is what the Word of God says. God wants you to live a full life of freedom. But we can never live the life that God has called us to live carrying unnecessary things. You can't run carrying a bunch of weight. In fact, the faster you pump your arms, the faster you can run. And when you're carrying stuff, there, there's no pumping your arms. In fact, running coaches will teach you how to, how to move your arms in a right way that actually makes you faster. And how you start the race is a lot of times how you finish the race. And the deal is God has called you and appointed you for such a time as this, but you can't run the race that he's called you to run carrying a bunch of unnecessary baggage. So we're going to look at some of those, those things today. It's so important that we see the men and women in the series that we're going to be doing as just ordinary people, living lives just like you and I. Everybody in the Bible is just like you and I. They were born, they have a common life, but all of a sudden there's one, there's one equal thing in their life that equals greatness. And the one thing that equals greatness in their life is they learn how to tap into God and to tap into the full potential that he has for their life. Today we're going to look at the story of Esther. It's in the Old Testament. You can turn with me to Esther now. We're going to be in that book the whole day. And in your small group this week, you're going to learn about Mary and Martha from the New Testament. 
So let me give you a picture and some information about Esther to help place her in the big picture of Scripture that we're looking at today. So about the book of Esther. The book of Esther is set in the Persian Empire in a time between 483 and 473 B.C. A hundred plus years after the Babylonian captivity, the story properly fits in between chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Nehemiah, after Nehemiah's return to Israel, and before Ezra's return to Israel. And the Jewish people in the book of, of Esther are those who remained behind in the Persian Empire while Nehemiah had returned. So it's after Nehemiah's return to Israel and before Ezra's return to Israel. And the Jewish people in the book of Esther are those who remain behind in the Persian Empire while Nehemiah returned, and they were still in captivity. So the main, the main characters in the book that we're going to look at today are Esther and her uncle Mordecai. Then there's the king of Persia, er, Exers, and Haman. And it's interesting to note that God is not mentioned anywhere in this book. God is not mentioned one time in this book. And yet you can see him working behind the scenes to deliver his people. Even though it was their rebellion, even though it was their wickedness, even though it was their downfalls that led to their exile, exile in Babylon in the first place. Now you may say, I'm, I've been in a bad place, Pastor. Things have been going wrong in my life. You may be sitting at home on your couch today saying everything's falling apart. And I haven't been following God. And you know that's okay? Because we see in the scripture right here. It was because of their own stupidity that they're, they're in captivity. It's because of the own thing, their own things that they've done, but God is still working on their behalf. I want you to know that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, gone no matter what's going on in your life, God is working on your behalf for you. He still cares about you. He still loves you. He still calls you his own. You're still a son and a daughter, and no matter what you've done, Jesus knew about every sin that you would ever commit before he ever hung on the cross, and he still did it just for you because he loves you. And so there's nothing that you can do that's bigger than our God and bigger than the love that he has for you. So today we're going to break down this story by the lessons we learn. Specifically, we're going to learn about God's providence and how to trust him even when we can't see him or feel him. And so the story today opens up with King Xerxes, and he's holding a banquet. Now, this, is thought, this banquet's thought to be a military strategy session. There's pomp, there's stance, there's the whole thing. There's probably an open bar. And they're all gathered around in some military strategy session, and he's with all of his buddies. They're talking about military strategy. And he decides that he's going to summon his wife. And so some upfront up things you need to know about this king. He's a wicked man. Very wicked man. He gets drunk. He calls his beautiful wife as he summons her down. He sees her as his trophy. Her name is Vashti. And he calls her to come and look and to show off her beauty and just to show her off. And she tells the king one magic word, no. And when she tells him no, he's furious. He gathers his men together and his men just feed the fuel. I mean, you know, we need small groups to feed the fuel during the week for us in a positive way. Now, there's people who are in your small groups of life who will feed the fuel in a negative way. And these guys gather around the king, and they're feeding the fuel in a negative way. She's got to pay a price for what she's done. She doesn't tell the king no. She doesn't do that. She can't open her mouth and say anything. And they urge the king to make a stand. I can imagine Christian men saying stupid things. Like, woman, submit. I'm the head of the house. Now, I want you to know that, yes, you may be the head of the house, but she's the neck that turns the head. 
And when you make stupid comments, you're going to get stupid results, men. Now, I'm talking to you today. And, and the truth is that if we would treat our wives like Jesus treated the church, in other words, loved them unconditionally and respect them and would even die for them or do anything for them, they'll gladly follow you. And that word follow is a lot better than that word submission. And so the king is embarrassed and he's mad at this woman and he acts in anger and he banishes her only to regret it later. How many of you have ever done anything that you regret and you did it out of anger? There's a lot of times in our lives we get mad, we get angry, and when we act out of that anger and we act and it becomes rage, that's when we get in trouble. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And so in Esther 2.1, it says, But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree that he had made. Now, I mean, how many of y'all got some real bright people in your life? And I'm, I'm being facetious when I say the word bright. That, that seem to tell you exactly what you should do and how you should do it and when you should do it. And they know nothing about your circumstance. And so these guys who give the king the bright idea come up with another idea to please the king. They're going to hold a beauty pageant, and the contest winner becomes the new queen. Now, they then got the king in trouble the first time, and he, he's done something that he regrets, and now he's going to follow their advice again. We get in trouble when we follow the advice of others and not the advice of God. But this guy didn't know God. So he's listening to the people around him. In Esther 2, 8, it says, As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, were brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. And here's where we see our first lesson from Esther today. I'm going to give you four lessons that we can learn from Esther. And if she was here, and if we could hear her in the great bandstands, I think she would tell us these things. Number one, if you're taking notes, God will use evil to position you to do good. In other words, what you think is evil in your life, what you think is the end, what you think is bad in your life, God can turn any circumstance and any situation into good. And I think that'd be the first thing that Esther told you, that a wicked man, even a wicked person in your life that you think is wicked and evil, God can take that person and he can use you to turn their heart and he can, you can, he can use you to make all things that are bad turn good. So God will position you to do good even when there's evil present. In Esther 2, 17, it says, and the king loved Esther more than any other young woman. In fact, he was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Ashta. And even though the king's actions were evil, and even though his culture treated women like property, God positions Esther to do good. In Esther 2.20, we read this. Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. Why? because she's in the Persian Empire and they hate Jews. She was still following her uncle Mordecai's directions just as she did when she lived in his home. So it's, um, it's important to understand that the Jewish people are a minority in this situation, and not just any minority, but they're despised at a high, high level by many in the Persian Empire and the Persian Kingdom. There, there's no culture that's ever been more abused than the Jewish people through the years. So Mordecai, Esther's uncle, who raised her, enters her into this beauty pageant. And not only does she go to the palace, but Mordecai becomes a palace official. And next we learn point number two, which is God will use you to bless your enemies. And yes, I said that. God will use you to bless your enemies. And you're probably sitting there thinking, Pastor, I don't want to bless my enemies. I want to hurt my enemies. 
I've heard the expression, I wouldn't spit on them if they were thirsty. I've heard people say all kinds of things about your, their enemies. But God will use you to bless your enemy. See, because in the kingdom of God, things work differently. And they're designed differently. In Esther 2.21, it says, One day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bethana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. Now Mordecai's on duty. He overhears the whole thing. And Mordecai, being a Jew, is in a very tempting position. And the question is, does he do the right thing? Or does he do the justifiable thing? Because after all, we know this is the evil king. We know he deserves whatever he gets, even if it is death. And so Mordecai has a dilemma. Do I do, do, I do give him what he deserves? Or do I, I tell him about what's going on and let him live? Do we allow the king to live or do we allow him to die? That's his dilemma. Does he inform them of the plot to save the king or to kill the king? What influenced his choice? And why does he decide to spare the king's life? Because we know Mordecai spares the king's life. It's because Mordecai knew he wasn't accountable to the king. See, Mordecai was accountable to the king of kings. And Mordecai knew that no matter what, he was accountable to God first. And that he would be held responsible for his actions, not the king's actions. In Luke 6, 27, it says this, but to you who are willing to listen, it means not everybody's willing to listen to this, but if you want to listen to this today, this is what the word of God says, and this is how you prosper as a Christian. I say, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. This is the word of God. This is what God says. If you want to live an overcoming life and you want God to use you at a higher level, this is how you do it. Sometimes the last thing we feel like doing is the only thing that will position us in God's big plan that's next for our life. Some of you are wondering, why can't I move to my next? Why can't I get out of the season of life I'm stuck in? It's because you refuse to move out of the season that you're in into the season God has for you because you're unwilling to do the one thing to be able to step into what God has for you. And in a lot of cases, that's forgiveness. In a lot of cases, that's carrying weight. And it's a lot of cases, it's just you can't get rid of the past because you can never run the race that God intended for you to run, running backwards and looking the other way. You weren't intended to look backwards. You were only intended to look forwards because Jesus covers everything that's behind you. And he has a plan for your life. Next thing we learn from Esther is point number three, doing the right thing will take courage and it always involves risk. It's never going to be easy to follow God. If it's easy, it's probably not God. If it doesn't make a tough decision, you, you make a tough decision, it's probably not God's will. God will, will bend you a little bit. He will mold you. Sometimes he'll break you, and he'll start over with you. You have to be okay with that because there's a purpose for your life, and the only way you can get to that purpose is to allow him to bring you into the place that he's called you to go. And sometimes we don't like that. Sometimes we don't want the pressure. Sometimes we don't want the pain. But it's the only way you will ever get to where God has called you to go. And it takes courage and involves risk. A lot of times we pray this way. God, will you do it for us? God, please take all the weight. We think it should be easy. Well, it shouldn't be hard if it's God, Right? If it was really God, it would just be easy. The door would just swing open, trumpets would sound, angels would go, oh, and you just walk right through it. Just, it's just easy. 
We want, we want that button, you know, an office depot, the easy button. That's what we want. You know what it says about doors in the Bible? It says, it says, if we'll ask, we'll seek, and we'll knock. Never says they're open. Ask, seek, knock. So many times, oh, well, Lord God, open the doors for us. We wonder why there's no doors open. It's because we're not asking, we're not seeking, and we're not knocking. You know where open doors lead to? Open doors lead to crack houses that have no value. And I just said that from the podium. There's something about being able to walk and to step into what God's called you to do and have the opportunities that God's called you to have. But the only way you'll get there is be able to risk it. We have a barbecue team here at Tribe. They say you got to risk it for the brisket. It's not always going to be easy. And that wasn't Esther's experience at all. It wasn't easy. Esther went just from the streets to the palace. See, because God can take and he can do something in an instant in your life. He can take you from being a nobody to being a somebody. And but being a somebody requires some accountability. And it's not always easy. She's been blessed with the favor of the king and life is good. It's all worked out. Then all of a sudden there's a new guy on the scene who's evil and worse than the king. And his name is Hamad. He's a really bad guy. He's a racist. And he doesn't just despise the Jewish people. He absolutely hates them with a passion. And so he gets promoted and he has the ear of the king. And he's crazy jealous of Mordecai. And not only is he a Jew, but he also, not a Jew, but he works in the king's palace and he doesn't like Mordecai because Mordecai is a Jew. And Mordecai doesn't like Haman either. And so Haman wants Mordecai to bow, and Mordecai refuses to bow down again, even though he has a high position. In Esther 3 5, we read it. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He learned of Mordecai's nationality. So he decided it was not enough just to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the whole entire empire of Xerxes. What enough just to kill Mordecai? See, racism extends past just a one person kind of opportunity. He wants to take everybody out. It's a spirit. And that spirit doesn't stop at one person. It, it travels. And it wants everybody. So Haman comes up with a plan for a day when anyone in the kingdom could rise up legally and kill a Jew and take their property with no consequences. In fact, they rolled the dice for which day it would be when they do. And these di dice or lots are called Purim. And, and a day one in one year in the future is decided and chosen for this Jewish purge. And the only good thing about this purge is they know when it's going to happen. And they know Esther has to step up to the plate. So Mordecai appeals to Esther. And Esther looks at Mordecai and says, what can I do? You ever feel like that with God? Well, what can I do? I'm just one person, God. I go to work, feed my kids, I go to sleep at night. I wake up and do it all over again. What can I really do to get back people's lives? And that's the greatest hindrance to the body of Christ is when we say, what can I do? What difference can I make? God's created you for this. He's created you more for more. So Esther says, what can I do? The king really has to invite me if I'm going to ask him a question. If I go to him and he doesn't hold out his staff, I'm dead like Queen Vashti. He doesn't like women asserting themselves. And this is Mordecai's response, and it's a famous scripture in the Word of God, and I want to read it real quick in Esther 4.13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Because God's going to take care of them whether you do it or not. In other words, you've got a mission to do in your life, 
And if you don't do it, God will raise somebody else up to do it. The do is there's purpose and plans for your life that God has. But if you don't do it, God will use somebody else. But God's called you. And he wants you. And you're the original plan. He's just waiting on you. But if you and your relatives will die, who knows what for if perhaps you will, you were made queen for such a time as this. Word of God says, you know, if you won't do it, somebody else will do it. And who knows, what if you were made queen for such a time as this? God promotes for a reason. God puts you somewhere for a reason. You might be sitting here today saying, I don't know why I'm in this church on this day at this time. It's because God wanted you to hear this message today. God does nothing by mistake. He's already walked into your tomorrow. He already has plans for your life. He's just waiting for you because he's created moments in your life that you were created for for such a time as this. God has called you. He's just waiting on you for such a time as this. Now Esther is on the hot seat and she has decisions to make. Will she follow Mordecai's example? Will she risk everything she has to do the right thing? Why is it hard for us to trust God sometimes? Why is it hard to trust God in times of uncertainty and fear? Why is it hard for us to say, well, you know, God did it once, he'll do it again. Well, why do we let the same things happen in our life over and over again where we know God has called us for more, but we just sit still waiting for somebody else to? I can think of a few of experiences through the years where I've struggled, where maybe I don't want to risk what I have. Maybe what I have and I'm comfortable with is just good enough. And comfort begins to become the enemy of progress. And I wonder if what I do will make a difference. Or I just don't truly trust God in a circumstance in my life. We've all had those circumstances in our life where we just didn't fully trust God. All these things and more must have been going through Esther's mind. She's sitting here thinking the king can kill me. What if this happens? Or what if that happens? But then all of a sudden something happens. Something rises up in Esther. And it's that moment in life that's tough and that's difficult when you decide to step out of the box that you've been living in. And you take a step. And you know who God is. And we think we take that step alone, but we don't. He steps with us. And she takes that step of faith in her life, and it propels her to a place of history. In fact, they still celebrate her life in Jewish custom today. There's that turning point where she just says, I'm going for it. And we see it in Esther 4.15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, nights, night or day. And my maids and I will do the same. And then, though it's against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. I'm doing it. Even though I'm scared, I'm going to trust God. Even though it doesn't look like the wise thing to do, I'm going to trust in who God is in my life. It reminds me of Joshua in the book of Joshua 24, where he tells the people, decide this day whom you're going to serve. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I don't care what a politician says. I don't care what happens in our country. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Doesn't matter what's happening in our city. Doesn't matter what's going on in what circumstances. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As Esther acts in courage and approaches the king. And God comes through big time. How do you know when we take a step of faith, God comes through? Peter never would have walked on water if he wouldn't have gotten out of the boat, out of the place of his comfort, and became vulnerable. The deal is, you'll never see great things happen in your life until you take those steps of faith. Esther 8 1, it says, On that same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king how they were related. See, Mordecai even knew he'd be revealed. 
Esther reveals to Mordecai this. And look at this. Esther takes a step of faith. And this is what happens when you take that step of faith. Not only does God step with you, not only does he take care of your enemies for you, because you love them and you pray for them anyway. Esther knew as a wicked king, her, her husband was a wicked king. She knew what he stood for. But she still loved for him. In fact, she asked him to pray that God would turn his heart. And she walks in and she walks in with God on her side, called, anointed, and appointed for such a time as this. And she walks into that room and God turns over all the possessions of the enemies into her hands. There's some possessions in your life that the enemies have a hold of. There's some things in your life that the enemies taken hold of. But when you step out of the place of fear and you realize that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High and you walk into what God has called you to walk into, not only you feel the sense of you just conquered. Not only do you get victory, but you get all the possessions of your enemies as well. It says, Then the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and he gives it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of all of Haman's property. Haman, Haman is gone. He's no longer a problem because of the faith that Esther had. And not only does she get all his property, but Mordecai gets a promotion because of his faith. And he gets to run all the property that now belongs to his family instead of his enemy. God will give you the possessions of your enemy when you do it the right way. He'll take care of you in every instance. In fact, Esther's pretty much given a blank check. And the Jewish people are allowed to fight back because she took a stand. And to this day, they celebrate the courage of Esther and Mordecai in the festival of Purim. Here's what we learn as we close the day and the team comes up. And I don't want you to ever forget this. This is point number four that we learned from Esther today. Point number four, God always, not sometimes, but God always takes care of his people. God elevates Esther to queen. He cared for his people in a foreign land. He did it then, and he continues to, continues to do it in our lives today. You might say, well, I'm, I'm in a foreign place in my life. I've never had everything fall apart like it's falling apart right now, Pastor. I'm in a place where it just seems desperate. I'm in a place where my finances are falling apart. I'm in a place where my life is falling apart. I'm in a place where my body's falling apart. And God says, I got you. It's okay. See, because you don't have to walk alone. You can walk with God. You just got to know who he is. Romans 8, 31 says this, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? Because if God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? This is simple. It's simple. Think about it. If he sent his own son to die for you, he gave you his own son. He gave you his own son. Won't he give you everything else? Won't he give you anything else you want? If you give you, you know how much val how valuable your kids are to you? I'd do anything for my kids. He took his son and said, you're more valuable than anything I've got, and I'm giving you my own son, and he's going to go, and he's going to die for you. If he'll give you his own kid, don't you think he'll give you anything else that you need in your life? Isaiah knew before Jesus ever got on the scene, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and he said, by his stripes were healed. He already made way for your healing. God told Isaiah, look what I'm about to do. I'm sending my son. Not only is he going to die for you, but he's going to pay the price for all your healing. And that's not just talking about some kind of cancer or some kind of plague that's on your body or some kind of broken bone. It's talking about your mental health. It's talking about your heart. It's talking about every area of your life. He heals you 
Matthew 21, 22 says, We ask anything in his name, believing it shall be done. That word ask in the Greek actually translates out to a teo, which means demand. In other words, don't just ask. Put a demand on it because he paid the price for you. He wants you to have enough faith and enough boldness that you know it can be done. That's who the God is we serve. And then Romans 8.32 says, Who dares accuse us of, of whom God has chosen for his own? Who dares accuse you? God chose you as his own. In other words, everything that you feel, I'm not worthy to, to serve God. I'm not worthy of this. Who dares accuse you? Of what, who dares judge you of what you've done? He knew about every sin that you would ever commit before he ever got on the cross. Who dares accuse you of what you've done? I'm just, don't ever say you're not good enough. He knew everything you'd ever do, and he still paid the price because he loves you. And if he gave you a son, he'll give you everything else. That's including freedom from the past. That's including your destiny. And that's including the purpose that he has and the calling that he has on your life. And then it says, no one can accuse you. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. God has given you right standing, not anybody else. Doesn't matter what your enemy thinks. Doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks. Doesn't matter what your ex thinks. Doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Because they're not the one that created you. They're not the one that destined you. They're not the one that called you and gives you purpose. Only God does that. And he loves you. It doesn't matter how much despair you're sitting in in your living room or your car or wherever you're at today. God loves you. He cares so much for you that he sent his son. And every thought that he has, you are on his mind. He has good things in your path just waiting on you. You might think, well, I don't even have a job right now, Pastor. It's okay. Because God's already seen that job. He's always, already walked ahead of you and has it sitting in your way, just waiting for you to trip into it. Because even yet, while we were still sinners, he died for us. Even while you were messing up, even while everything in your life was going wrong, he still thought about you. He still hung there for you. He still endured the pain of the cross. Why? It wasn't for him. It was for you. Other people say, well, well, pastor, why did, if he's such a good God, why did he create hell? It wasn't created for you. It was created for the devil and, and the fallen angels who followed, the, followed Lucifer out of heaven. That's why it was created. In fact, he loved you so much that he gives you a way out. All you have to do is accept the free gift. Be ashamed to have Christmas presents sitting under a tree that you never went, grabbed, and opened. You just looked at him forevermore and said, oh, there's my gift. But yet so many of us do that. So many of us walk every day right past the free gifts that God gives us, right past the purpose that he has for your life. We just avoid it. We ignore it when he just wants us to open up his love and his goodness because his mercy endures forever. Stand with me as we pray today and as Pastor Sam comes. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're a good, good father. We thank you, Father, that even before time, you'd predestined every step that we were going to take. Every thought that you have is putting goodness and mercy in our path. And every step that we take, Father, you're a lamp into our feet. Like how it says he's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. In other words, not only does he make bright right where you're standing at the moment, but he illuminates it all along the way. Father, you've illuminated even the future of our life. All we have to do is call on you. All we have to do is let go of the weight. Let go of the weight. And roll the dice. And say, Jesus, save me, fill me, and deliver me. And you do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Pastor Sam's going to come. Oh, incredible, incredible message.
uh, this morning. I'm going to ask our prayer partner to go ahead and come forward. Uh, he gave us four lessons from Esther this morning. Uh, number one, he said, God will use evil to position you to do good. Number two, he said, God will use you to bless your enemies. Number three, doing the right thing will take courage and involve risk. And number four, God will always take care of his people. Those are beautiful lessons that we can learn from an amazing, amazing woman in the Bible. Um, but we're, we're going to go ahead and go into our salvation part of the service. So if you can bow your heads and close your eyes. This is a decision between you and God and you and God alone. No one else is looking at you. No one else is asking you to make this decision. This is only between you and him. And so I really would like you to look internally and ask yourself, am I right with God? Do I know what will happen to me when I pass away? And if you have questions, if you have doubt, this is your invitation to come to Jesus, to come home to God. Because you are a son or a daughter, every single one of us in this room. So please consider coming home today. Maybe you say, I, I, I was a Christian a long time ago. I've walked away from him. I've done my own thing. But I want to invite you back. Maybe you've never met God today. I want to invite you in. So with no one looking around, your eyes closed. I'm going to ask you to, to raise your hand if you'd like to meet God today. And it's, a, it's a small step, but I'll, I just want you to take a bold step of faith today. So when I count to three, all you got to do is raise your hand. One, two, three. Say that to me. I need to meet God today. I need to come back to him. Can we pray this prayer together? Say, dear Jesus, today I admit I am broken. I am a sinner, and I've made mistakes. But today, I want to come home. I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. And then from this day forward, I will live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can you give God a hand of praise this morning? Come on. God is good. If you lifted your hand this morning, we want to place a resource in your hand. Okay, if you lifted your hand, you met God, or you came came back to him today, this is a 21-day devotional. And I would love for you guys to pick it up because it will change your life, I promise you. This is everything you need for your next step in life if you just met God. How you get it is you go out to the left of the Connect desk. These books are at that Connect desk. Just say, hey, I gave my life to God today. I want to get that 21-day devotional. Okay, you can do that today. So please make that decision. If you'd like to get prayer, you can stay and get prayer. If you'd like to stay in worship, you can do that as well. If not, have an amazing Sunday. We will see you guys next week.